So, and our first speaker is Vladimir. Vladimir, and he will be speaking about his his cast. And not really. I don't want to make this a product presentation. Definitely not. Uh, I would like to talk about streaming in general. And yeah, I will shut up. All right. Thank you. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. And I would like to talk about streaming as a par paradigm as a process of building application in a modern way. Uh, what is my motivation? Uh, actually, I'm talking as a product manager. I'm talking to our customers and prospects and to the users. And I uh, generally keep seeing that the awareness about the stream processing is generally low. I mean, it's partially because of it's quite or it's fairly new technology been here for five years, since the early beginnings. Uh, all these gardeners and foresters predicted to be major technology in two, three, four years. So right now it's adopted just by uh, big players and innovators. So the, the general mind share is low. This is the first thing. Uh, then I think that the principles behind stream processing make sense, even if you generally don't work on the data projects, because they are quite quite nice and if you are a programmer and if you like intend to have uh, a general knowledge of the market or about uh, about technologies this is really cool uh, and the last thing I think that right now the streaming products available on the market are generally quite complex so this really prevents an adoption because if you want to play with something and it's like it takes two days to even set up without, without building something then it's just for people who are really really good so as I said, I work for Hazelcast. Uh, who have heard about Hazelcast product before? Okay, quite a few, but mostly my friends. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I believe that the mind share of Hazelcast itself, it's quite like significant, right? It's a product that's here for like 10 years and generally it's uh, distributed in memory storage. Right, so it's generally used for distributed caching as in-memory key, key value store. And the nice thing is that it implements a standard collection API in Java, but it makes it distributed. So who of you actually works or programs in Java? Okay, it's much more. So instead of using just Java collections map, uh, you use the same API via Hazelcast, but the memory is actually scaled to all the computers where the Hazelcast cluster actually works. So you can easily scale up the in-memory storage layer of your application just by this. So this is Hazelcast, this is a Hazelcast brand. And Hazelcast company three years ago started a project called Hazelcast Jet, which is all about streaming. So therefore, I am here right now. So just this distinction. Right, what is stream processing? We will start with some general positioning of the whole problem, then let's talk about the pitfalls of the stream processing and let's conclude with some demo to show you that it isn't as complicated at all. Generally, data processing is about massaging the data and moving it from place to place. I understand that it's quite general statement, but I keep seeing more and more IT projects and IT activities being about data processing and I think Historically, I came from the enterprise software development, and especially here in Central Europe, most of the enterprise architectures are about big, fat, relational DB in the middle, and all the applications build around it. And every like applicable and possible uh, data workload is just some SQL query that's run against the database, which is quite nice simplification, and it works until some limit. The database, the centralized database quickly becomes a bottleneck. So for like innovators and startups and cor corporations that deal with bigger data amounts, it's quite natural to decompose the, this big database into smaller systems of record that fit better into that specific data workload, right? So you have like object storage for storing lots of data in the files. You have indexing service to store indexes, right? You have some in-memory cache to serve the data really fast. And more and more and more. And with more systems of record across the organization, then you of course need something to pump the data between those systems and to process the data on the fly. So therefore, I think that data processing and stream processing is a novel approach to that. 
is sort of valid even for people who don't work on the data project right now. All right, so what are the traditional approaches for working with data, for processing the data? Uh, I have already mentioned something like issuing an SQL command, uh, right? Actually uh, asking or sending some requests to, to a database system, uh, waiting for the, for the response and receiving the data this way. This is quite nice. Uh, however, yeah, it provides a low latency, right? You submit a request and you expect a response within seconds at most. However, that works just for small volumes. One cannot expect to, to the system like that to work with like millions of queries per second. It just doesn't work. Uh, then there is another approach, which is batch processing. You have some big data set somewhere. Uh, you start some job. The job reads the data somehow combines them, aggregates them, computes some stats, trains some machine learning model, and after minutes, days, hours, stores the result to some, uh, some destination system. It's slightly different. It's not about request and response. Your data are somewhere. The records in the data set are sort of requests, inputs, and then after the batch processing is done, you can find the answers in the result data set. And stream processing actually tries to marry the best of both, right? So from a batch processing, it takes the big data volumes, which is capable of, the, of processing, and from the online systems, systems, it takes the low latency. It's still like a data stream, so it's not that request-response pattern, right? You have some data that flow through your streaming system. Your stream processor keeps processing the data and providing the results. Uh, however, opposed to online systems, it's, it's able to process like millions of records per second, gigabytes of data per second. Uh, and the key point, it's nothing new. It's here for ages, right? Maybe you have heard about complex event processing, which is about uh, being connected to multiple data sets, uh, reading the data, and doing and trying to find some patterns in that data. Like if something occurs uh, five minutes after something else, then conclude some, uh, some outcome. And yeah, the research goes back to early 2000s, then the products like Esper and Apama should emerge. So that's here for quite a time. Materialized leaves in the databases, all of you know this, right? This is just a stream processing. There is some SQL query that listens for changes on some database tables and updates some materialized, materialized view, some cache of a changed data. And as you can see, it's a technology back from the 90s. Going even back, I mean, Unix pipelines, right? You connect multiple small applications with some small buffers, that's it. You get something like a primitive streaming application. And it's like wonderfully powerful. So this is nothing new. What's new is a scale. With stream processing solutions of today, you can bring this to a distributed environment. You can run this uh, uh, like on top of multiple machines, not just in one process. So the whole hype around stream processing is basically some celebration of yeah, we get this, we get this to scale. Right. Uh, so what is actually the stream processing pipeline? How does this look like? Uh, let me mention four important building blocks. First one is basically the applications or sensors or, or whatever that produces the data events, right? A stream is basically a sequence of some data events and it may be like updates from some like sensors, right? It may be log events from your applications. It may be like some domain events like user logged in, user add something to the shopping cart or something like that. And it may be change log from database. Every time something changes in the database, database table, it's some kind of events. So this is first part, this is an event producer. The second part, it's something like a buffer. I mentioned the Unix pipelines, the pipelines providing some kind of buffering that basically allows you to decouple even producers from a stream processing solution, which is really nice because you can have more stream processing applications working on top of, of one data stream, and you can also have like multiple even producers writing writing to the buffer. So that is another part, this, this, this buffer. It basically materializes that stream, right? It's not any virtual stream anymore. It's some append only, mostly storage, where you keep adding the events as, as they are produced by your systems. And then there is finally the stream processor. 
so so some 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 solution that like transforms the data, allows you to combine them by like joining and, and aggregating, uh, allows you to stream them, meaning uh, meaning. Uh, somehow take, taking the right items from the data stream and combining them together, and finally running some computation on top of the data in, in parallel. Uh, the typical use cases for these stream processing stream processing stream processing systems are something like that. Generally, everything is some kind of real time data analytics. So again, detecting some fraud or anomalies, right? Uh, searching for some patterns in the data sets. Quite frequent use case is log processing. So you have some big infrastructure, you ingest the log events from all the computers within your infrastructure, and in real time, you try to detect some fraudulent patterns, whether there isn't, for example, failure, or whether there isn't some indication of the failure. Another use case is predictive analytics. You have like a machine learning model, you train it somewhere, you take the model, you deploy it to a streaming application, and you do this classification uh, in the in the real time. Uh, another application is joining multiple stream uh, streams. The textbook use case for this is uh, some advertisement processing. Right? You have one stream with uh, at impressions. So as soon as you show some advertis advertisement on some web page. You lock this as an event to one stream. And then if a user clicks on the ad, it's another event. And you use a stream processor to combine those two, two streams. Uh, enriching is some form of join where you basic, basically your data flow through your application and you use some lookup table to enrich that stream with some extra information. Uh, and last but not least is actually implementing the event sourcing architectures. Uh, is there anybody who has some real experience with event sourcing, implementing it? Okay, some almost, hands. Almost, almost everyone. Almost everyone, that's great. So generally it's about, yeah, it's a suggestion for you to uh, have your data uh, not in the to use a log as a system of record, right? So you basically store your data in the form of events, of change events, not in the form of a current value. And definitely stream processing is a good tool to observe this stream of events and update some cache with, with current stuff. Right, so that was pretty nice. However, what are the challenges of stream processing? Let, let me talk about four, which are the most obvious and which are sort of novel because the previous one were already solved by, by the system I, systems I mentioned. The first one is actually the infinite input. Uh, with, uh, with a batch system, you had a data set. For example, uh, imagine use case where your goal is to compute the numbers of, of items in some data set, right? With a batch processing, that was like fairly easy. The data set was, was bounded, it was finite. So you start the processing, you read the whole data set, and as soon as you process the data set, that was the end of the data, and you can provide the result of your computation, that final count. With stream processing, it's different. The stream is generally something infinite, unbounded. It keeps coming for ages. It doesn't have a start, or it has a start technically, but it doesn't have has an end. So you have to come up with some tool that allows you to chop the stream into some, into some data blocks, which can be used for your application. And it's important even from like the business perspective, right? Because going back to, to, that, uh, to that sample with counting the data, nobody is actually interested in knowing how much data flew through your system since your application was, was started. It doesn't have any value. It's more about how much data uh, like passed the systems in last 10 seconds. So you need some tool to deal with this. And this tool is actually called Windows. There are generally three types of windows that are in use. Tumbling windows, sliding windows, and session windows. Uh, it's fairly simple. Hope you like my visualization. <laughs> Tumbling windows definitely or really just chop the streams to some finite chunks, right? So you have 10 minutes windows. So even that came from 10 p.m. to 10, 10 fell into first windows and so on. Slightly more complicated are sliding windows. It's still about windows with the same fixed length, so it's 10 minutes. 
However, uh, there is some sliding steps. Uh, so the window, uh, the window, windows can basically overlap, which is useful, as as will be shown in the demo. When you, for example, need some more frequent updates, right? You are interested in having updates every five minutes, but you want take ten minutes of data to be taken into consideration. The last thing is session windows that aren't driven explicitly. Uh, explicitly by some uh, for some fixed size. However, it's mostly about some user or system activity with some timeout that, that, that closes the window, right? So if the blue user uh, has some activity in 10 and 10.1 and 10.3, uh, and then uh, uh, more than three minutes without an activity, then this window closes and the data are sent for the computation. So that's Windows. Another concern, concern number two, is basically the light beams, because yeah, uh, in the previous pictures I referred to some data timestamps, to some timestamps. However, where did they come from? And you can do like two strategies. One strategy is as soon as the data items arrives at the stream processor, you can basically look on the wall clock and and use the use that time. Another, time, another, another method which is more, more useful is basically looking into the respective data item and extracting the data timestamp of its origination from, from the data. So that is another concern. However, with this, uh, you have to take into consideration that data may come out of order because uh, yeah, they generally travel to the stream processor across a wire and there can be, for example, some network partition, or a nice example is a players like playing a mobile game, right? Your stream processor's task is to process, uh, to compute a leaderboard of an online players. And one of the players actually boards a plane, goes to flight mode, so he's offline. And he's flying overseas, so he will be offline for the next 10 hours. And if you want to produce a leaderboard every 30 seconds, right, technically you have to wait those 10 hours before all the data arrives to your streaming system. So that actually isn't what you want, right? So you, have to, so you have to come up with some strategy. It's generally heuristics. You cannot be sure how long will you wait for the late data. Right, uh, concern number three is fault tolerance. Again, with batch jobs, if something like breaks or broke, it was fairly easy to restart the batch job, batch job from the beginning. Right? You just fix your system and then you reread the whole data set and process it from the beginning. This isn't the case with stream processing solution because as I have said, the stream actually, the stream processing application is supposed to run for ages, right? So you cannot reply one year long or old stream in order to get the same results. So you have to come up with a different strategy and actually what is quite sound strategy is back up your streaming system like regularly and if something goes wrong uh, then you go back to the last backup you rewind your data source to a respective moments where you basically left off and you replay that computation i'm getting slightly short of time so i won't explain this part with distributed snapshots let me just refer to the fact that something like that exists <laughs> and it's, it's a tool to uh, to actually do a snapshot of the distributed system, which isn't easy, right? If you have multiple machines running your streaming computation, you cannot just tell to all of them now do the snapshot. That doesn't work in the distributed environment, right? That now can uh, can uh, can can go can travel to the different machines with a different duration, so your snapshot won't be. Uh, won't be consistent anymore. There are tools to, to overcome that. All right, and the last concern is actually complexity. And the complexity is sort of inherent as with a streaming pipeline, maybe you can recall that, that, that picture, that schema that I had in the beginning. There is a lot of moving parts and you have to set up all of them in order to be able to play with the stream processing system, right? So you have to have a stream processing engine itself. You have to have the data source, which is to be replayable, right? So that mostly the current deployments with Kafka, but Kafka needs Zookeeper in order to run properly, right? Then you need something like a cluster manager, which takes care about your cluster, about upscales and downscales and stuff like that. 
So again, it's another infrastructure that you have to install. Uh, I've mentioned these state snapshots, right? The system creates the state snapshots regularly in order to be able to uh, to uh, to basically reconstruct its state after failures. So again, it's something that must be highly available, have available something like HDFS, which is another part. And finally, you need something as a data sync. So it's a lot of moving parts, and this is fairly, fairly complicated. Uh, right now, I will be a little bit more product-oriented, as I would like to present Jet. Uh, it generally has a solution for, the, for this complexity. As I have mentioned, the company Hazelcast itself traditionally is based on a distributed in-memory storage, and Hazelcast Jet as a streaming solution is based on that. So if you start a Jet cluster, you out of the box get a storage that's embedded, and that's quite a big deal because you can use the storage for ingestion. So you don't have to install Kafka or something like that. You can use the in-memory structure that's available just out of the box. You can use another data structure as a result store. So as soon as the computation is completed, you can publish the results to another, for example, map that's available within the same cluster. Third thing, I have mentioned this snapshot store, uh, this, this part on, uh, yeah, yeah, snapshot storage that's necessary for fault tolerance, right? Jet also uses Hazelcast in memory data grid that's embedded, this storage that's embedded within Hazelcast to store the, uh, the, the snapshots, which is a huge simplification. So generally, with Hazelcast Jet, all that you need is one Java library, one jar. You can technically embed it into your application as it's just Java library, right? To, in order to do a stream processing. And actually, let me show how this works. So I will, uh, I will switch, switch to, the, to the demo. And OK, I will work from, from, from IntelliJ. What this is about, at the, input, <laughs> yeah, okay. at the input, what we will have is a data feed. It's a live data feed. Uh, with <laughs> uh, with uh, with a plane positions in any time there are about five thousand to ten thousand plane planes in the air and this will be our input every ten seconds we will get an update of all the planes mostly with the position updates and our goal is to compute the CO2 emissions and the noise impact in some defined regions. And how we will do that? Is it visible? I, I love the ASCII art. Ah, yeah, 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 I spent two hours today just like that. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine. So we will have basically two streaming jobs. One, the first one will be fairly simple. It, it just reads uh, that online feed and writes it to that in-memory buffer uh, in chat. The other one actually does the heavy lifting. So, uh, in first step, we have to understand whether the plane is flying up or down, because that's important for both noise and CO2, right? And the approach is that we observe every plane for one minute. We keep gathering the position, mostly the altitude of every plane within one minute, and we use this information to compute a linear trend, whether the plane is flying up or down, this is first thing. Uh, as soon as we have this information, uh, we basically fork the pipeline, in the first part, we enrich this direction information uh, with uh, CO2 information. So we take a, a type of the plane, we take its direction, and we have some table where this is mapped to the CO2 emission of the plane, similarly with the noise. And then we calculate a summed CO2 level for a specific region, and similarly with a noise. Uh, yeah, and then we will basically uh, flush this into, into Grafana. I have a Docker image with Grafana here, so this will work for us as a visualization. Uh, right, so yeah, and let me show you the code. It's actually fairly simple. If, if a product manager is capable of, of writing and running it, it cannot be, cannot be difficult. So in the main method, we mostly uh, built the two pipelines. This is an important part. I will go through the code of how the pipelines are built, and we run them. So this first pipeline isn't doing anything more than reading that, uh, that actually pulling every 10 seconds, pulling this, this, this live feed and pumping it to our in-memory buffer. And this is the heavy lifting, 
right? So what do we do? We read the values or read the stream from, from the in-memory buffer. We uh, actually say to JET where in every record is the information about the timestamp. And if the information is older than 15 minutes, we consider it too old and we basically throw that, uh, that information away. Uh, we filter data and assign the our, uh, airport information. And in this step, we basically say, okay, for every plane, take last, six, last 60 seconds of its positioning data and compute a linear trend out of it, which is this aggregate operation. Okay, so right now what we have is for every plane, we have its trend, its direction in last 60 seconds, and we do like four things, four forks with it. We send uh, ascending and descending uh, planes to, to destinations, and uh, within two, into those steps, we generally compute uh, noise per every plane, and we group the information by the defined region, defined, uh, defined area. Okay, let me run this. So I will start the image with Grafana. This is in Docker, so okay, it's there. Let me start start directly from here. SQR is our favorite <laughs> part-time activity. So as you can see, the job has started, right? It produces produces some uh, some logs. Uh, what we can see is that every like 10 seconds, it pulls for the new data. It drops the even events that are late, and everything seems to work. So let's 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 switch to Grafana. Okay. It will take some time until some data pop up in the in the in the charts. So in the meanwhile, let me show you one more trick. Yeah, we can see some planes have landed within within the time period, and we shall see how the charts will be affected. However, we wait for one minute until the windows uh, get actually filled. Right. Let me go back to IDE. So this was one trick, right? Uh, another thing I would like to show you. So, so it, it, just to just to recap, right? I use just one Java library. I start from the IDE and I'm running a stream processing application. However, a stream processing application on one node that's no big deal. So I've written uh, like another app, which is in this this upscale method, and uh, I will technically uh, start the application. It will uh, discover the running one node jet cluster. And what it will do is ensure that it's just existing and running, and it will join the cluster, so it will el elastically upscale the computation. And under the hood, what this is doing, I have mentioned these state snapshots. Uh, so this, uh, this running application is, is doing this snapshot every 10 seconds. So when the node joins the cluster, it basically goes back to the last snapshots, rewinds the data source, and joins the computation, and that's it. Right now, we are running, running in a two-node cluster, and everything works just, just seamlessly. Going back to demo, okay, yeah, we can see the charts filling in with the data. So you can see that for each respective airport, there is that CO2 emission and and, and noise produced in the airport neighborhood, and it works quite vice versa as well. If I just kill the node, uh, the computation is able to survive, it goes back to the last snapshot, and it just keep, keeps computing. Okay, and that's about it. I already almost ran out of time, so sorry about that. Uh, right, right, that was about it, so let's go to the questions. Okay, so who has a question? Please. I'll I have some t-shirts, so <laughs> yeah. okay, maybe you can show the t-shirts, so they will be more like. Oh, I have a question. <laughs> so there is one large and one medium. <laughs> <laughs> I want the medium one. <laughs> that's basically that's not the question. <laughs> so can I get them? <laughs> can I have a question? Sure. How do you differentiate from uh, Kafka or Spark? That's a good question. I think Kafka technically is 
it's a storage, right? I mean, you refer to Kafka Streams. And Kafka Streams is a great tool. However, it's mostly for converting one Kafka topic to the other Kafka topic. Jet isn't opinionated about data sources or things, so you can connect Jet to multiple data sources and multiple data things. So the architecture of both solutions is roughly comparable. It's the same like market domain. Uh, yeah, Kafka streams are mostly more closer to Kafka. We are closer to uh, Hazelcast like in memory storage. So that's Kafka streams. And with the Spark, Spark was the first like major application in this domain, and it uses an older concept. So instead of low latency streaming, processing every item as it comes, it uses micro batching approach. So it's technically a batching system, and it's, it, it just gathers the incoming data into some batch, which might be one, five, 10 seconds long, before sending to the computation. So the latency, the overall latency of your computation is extended this way. But yeah, Spark is a great tool, and I mean, it's the only tool of, on this marketplace that already passed the uh, early adoption phase considered sort of major issue. So, medium or large? <laughs> medium. All right. Okay, it's waiting for you here. Another question. Okay, what would you say are the like the most important missing features in like, 0 0.5 until there's 1.0 version? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's mostly about because it's 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 like alpha, beta right now, right? I would say beta. And the current features that are there are like stable. The quality is there. What's missing is tools for diagnostics and monitoring. And we think it's just important for production use cases. So therefore, we refer to JET 0.6. And we aim to release 1.0 with all these diagnostics and tooling and monitoring in the package for, for releasing 1.0. What happens when you know, time goes back when the process is like that? One second is subscribed. How do you mean it? Well, actually, it happens from time to time that uh, time is adjusted. So, in a, so one second in a time happens two times actually. I mean, in stream processing application, generally the time is, is observed from the data stream, mm -hmm. right? So, so if yeah. like accidentally you you receive the data items that are already like too late, you just drop it. Mm -hmm. But this can be configured if you somehow expect the late data to come. You can adjust the configuration and consider that for the moment of time being a standard situation. But so this could happen, for example, with second year uh, yeah. so <laughs> yes. so, so Actually, Kafka uh, I had an issue with this like, like, second. <laughs> uh, uh, let, let me zoom in chance and stuff like that. I know, but the time is time step, right? So let me zoom in chance is the interpretation. So. Well, yeah, you, okay, you, you, you but, but sometimes time is adjusted just by water second, even to the back. Mm -hmm. to the forward, and actually Kafka had an issue with this. Uh, I mean, yeah, if you consume a stream and if you look to the data items for the information yeah. about time, you have to accept the fact that the items will come out of order and you have to accept some latency. So we generally say, I accept all, I accept items that are 10 seconds like old, for example, mm -hmm. and that's up to you. And it will introduce some latency into your application, but it's a necessary operational concern. You cannot do it the other way. All right, and I think M, M fits you quite well. <laughs> <laughs> or L, sorry. No. Okay, guys, I mean, thank you for your attention. I'm already out of time, so. Okay, thank you very much.